After the success of Death Rally and the first two Max Payne titles, there were a lot of people eager to see what Remedy would do next. What they did next was Alan Wake, which was first revealed at E3 2005. By 2006, it was announced that Remedy would be partnering with Microsoft to bring the game to Xbox 360 and PC. Between that initial announcement and the game's launch, there were long periods of time with no updates from Remedy. We've since learned that this was because the game was going through a lot of significant changes, having started out as a mission-based open-world game and eventually shifting to the more linear game that we eventually got. However, once the final version of Alan Wake came together, there was a huge push to get eyes on the game. In this video, we'll be taking a look at some of the marketing and advertising for that first Alan Wake game. In the US, players may have seen this ad in gaming magazines leading up to the release of Alan Wake. The tagline reads, the closer he gets to the truth, the closer it gets to him. It also directs players to xbox.com slash Alan Wake, where they could have watched Bright Falls, the live action prequel to the game. I found it interesting that they didn't mention in the ad that Bright Falls is a live action web series. That kind of seems like the unique thing they could have capitalized on. I've always been really impressed by how well that show managed to communicate the tone of Bright Falls and Alan Wake. Back in the summer of 2023, I got in touch with Nate Abel, who worked as the art director on the Bright Falls web series. He worked at Agency 215, an advertising agency that has had a long-standing relationship with Microsoft. He said that it was easy to stay true to the look and feel of the game because it had such a distinctive tone, with clear points of reference like Twin Peaks and the Pacific Northwest. The show's director, Phil Van, is actually from that area, and that's where the team shot the show. According to Nate, Bright Falls was really meant to hook people on the world of the game, so when Alan Wake finally released, they thought, hell yeah, I want to spend more time there. He also said that the show received the most passionate response to any gaming project that he had ever worked on. I asked Nate if he could share any anecdotes from his time working on the show. He revealed that he was the one tasked with designing the notepad that can be seen after Jake Fisher's initial meeting with Dr. Hartman. Nate said that after shooting all day and into the night, he was at his hotel room at about 2 a.m., designing the sketches and ramblings so that they could have the notepad on set the next day. My full interview with Nate Abel is up on our Patreon right now as a free post, and there's a link to it down in the description of this video. You don't need an account or anything to view it. Patreon is just a convenient place for us to host things like that interview. Also, I'd like to send a big thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. And if you've got even a buck or two a month to contribute to the channel, your contribution can go a long way. Anyway, in Canada, several agencies were hired to work on different aspects of an ad campaign using the tagline, Dark is Deadly. This print ad shows a light switch with the word dead on it. Honestly, this is my least favorite in the series because I feel like all of the other ads in this campaign are way more creative, even if they might not be entirely accurate to the tone or even the content of the game. This next print ad shows a light bulb hanging from a rope, causing it to resemble a noose. In this third print ad, we have a light bulb cover projecting the shape of a coffin onto a wall. This concept of playing with lights and shadows was translated into what I think were some really effective installations. The coffin ad had a variation that would light up at night, and a large-scale physical version of the concept was also constructed. Another installation utilized a sundial that would shift from alive to dead as the sun went down. This ad featured a flashlight behind a clear panel, reading, in case of psychotic lumberjack, break glass. An article covering this ad campaign also mentions that some bars in Montreal had their bathrooms treated with UV paint and black lights. 
people would walk in and the black lights would come on, revealing bloodstains, smeared handprints, and a message reading, stay in the light. There would also be a URL, darkisdeadly.ca, which I'm assuming may have redirected back to the Alan Wake page on the Xbox website. These bathroom installations didn't make any direct mention of Alan Wake or the fact that it was an ad for a video game. The idea was to give people a thrill that the advertisers felt was in line with the experience of playing Alan Wake. They also felt like their target audience wasn't paying attention to traditional advertising, and that a stunt like this would garner more interest from them. This campaign ran through the month of May 2010, and it had a clear focus on horror, which ultimately feels a little misleading to me. Alan Wake, according to its own description on the box, is a psychological action thriller, not a horror story. It's about a horror story, but the sort of middle ground that Alan Wake finds in terms of genre is a bit difficult to market. It's a game about mysteries and the unknown, and it's difficult to show too much of that without starting to spoil the intrigue. Different regions took different approaches to this problem. In Australia, Xbox conducted something called The Project. Five test subjects were blindfolded and put in the back of a van, which brought them to the most haunted site in Australia. Over 500 people who died here, so it is the most haunted site in Australia. They were then brought into a structure where they were unblindfolded and equipped with heart rate monitors. They then played sections of Alan Wake and had their heart rate monitored throughout. This was all filmed and turned into a series of six videos, with one introductory video and one video for each of the five participants. Even though the intro video seems to give the impression that they're trying to scare the players, everyone more or less seems to have had a pretty moderate reaction to the game. Jump scares and tense moments did cause a few spikes in heart rate, but the participants spent a lot more time talking about the engaging story, the mildly frustrating gameplay, and an overall feeling of curiosity in regards to where the full game might go. In Poland, there was an Alan Wake-inspired ARG. I found a Polish-language video recapping this, but had a hard time deciphering it. Thankfully, after some more research, I found this version of the video in English. Now, this ARG was super involved, so rather than try to break it down myself, I'll show you this clip from a video made by the agency that handled the campaign. The Brief To promote the launch of the Alan Wake video game, a thriller based on the concept of the struggle between light and darkness, the idea to engage the target group to participate in a story similar to a video game scenario, to create an alternate reality game set in the climate of Alan Wake. The game. We created the characters of Alec, a gamer and a blogger, and his beautiful girlfriend Anka. They live a normal life until one day Anka mysteriously disappears. Alec offers a 10,000's lottery reward to help find the girl. The three week long game begins. Alec finds the girl's diary with a business card pointing towards a spa in the town of Sobutka. The players hack the girl's account on the spa's website, and the hero decides to take a train to Sobutka. Anka never arrived. During a night spent in a hostel, he witnesses paranormal activities that drive him back home. The video from this night shows the players that something wanted to tell Alec to find four runes. The next day, the players find the second part of the diary. It's filled with strange symbols and drawings. Over the next few days, the players manage to solve them and figure out that they were pointing to three cities, Olsztyn, Kielce and Poznan. These three 
with the addition of Sobutka put on a map by one of the players, gave the first rune needed to find the girl. The next day, Alec gets a strange MMS. It's a picture of a code slip from a train station locker. Some of the players venture to the station and pick up an envelope with yet another puzzle. The players quickly solve it. The day after, Anka appears on a communicator. There's a clue in her status. Look for the answers in the stars. The next morning, Alec gets a photo on which Anka is seen somewhere near Yarmuta mountain. The players figure out that Sobutka and Yarmuta were connected to pagan Slavic beliefs. They insist on Alec going to Yashembya Gura. This wasn't in the script, but we managed to send a photographer to take some pictures from the day Alec was supposed to go there. Of course, it's a dead end. Alec comes back home and decides to hack into Anka's email box with the help of the players. Long analysis of all the emails brings nothing. Sometime later, a new mail with a riddle appears in the mailbox. The players solve it. It's the word Ash. The next day brings another riddle. This time the players have to use one of the older emails to solve it. It's the word Sky. One of the players brings up a picture that has been previously uploaded by Alec. This picture, combined with the answers to the last riddles, gave our players the second rune, the constellation of the Phoenix. After a while, Alec is called by Anka's grandmother. The old lady tells him the story of their family descending from a famous Polish witch, Sidonia von Borg. The next day, the old lady calls Alec again. Her telephone sends strange signals. The players figure out that it's Morse code with a series of numbers. The numbers point towards the Ethnology Museum. The players go to the museum during the Night of the Museums to find an exhibition of a von Bork medallion. The artifact is covered with numbers. The players figure out that the numbers put on a coordinate system give the third room. Three finalists are selected to help Alec in finding the girl during the all-night live finale of the game. In the end, Alec and Anka are reunited, and the lucky winner gets the main prize, 10,000 Zlotties. A lot of these ad campaigns have case study videos available online. Case studies are like a brief post-mortem or a recap of a campaign. And for a lot of the campaigns featured in this video, the case studies are the only remaining evidence of them that I can find online. While the ARG campaign appears to have been a success, the case study doesn't really explain how it got the word out about Alan Wake. Regardless, this was a very ambitious campaign, and it's the sort of thing that I would love to see utilized for a future Remedy game. There were a handful of other online campaigns that were less complex than that ARG, but I feel that they were still very creative and engaging. The same agency that handled the Bright Falls web series also established a Bright Falls station on Pandora. If you're unfamiliar, Pandora is a streaming service that has a focus on delivering personalized music streams based on different categories and keywords. And those are called stations. The Bright Falls station featured music from the game, along with related songs picked by Pandora's algorithm. The music was interspersed with audio clips of Pat Main, the local radio DJ in the Alan Wake series. I found a video of a pop-up ad that used a flashlight gimmick where you would use your mouse to move the light around and reveal hidden messages related to the game. A similar idea was used in another campaign that launched prior to the release of Alan Wake. It had prospective players use their phones and webcams together to manipulate a virtual flashlight. A mobile app was used to connect everything, and people who used it were rewarded with exclusive previews of the game. A Facebook post made on the official Alan Wake page back on May 6th of 2010 mentions the Verizon Hunt for Light competition, and it directs people to the Alan Wake microsite for more details. The competition's prize was a trip to Finland, where the winner would get to visit the Remedy Studio. I had been trying to figure out what the microsite actually was, but I wasn't able to find much more information about it. However, eventually I did find a video that featured a preview of the site, uploaded back in 2010 by an Atlanta, Georgia-based art director, motion designer, and 3D animator named Drew Smoot. 
Drew worked for the agency that handled the site. I reached out to him to ask about it, but unfortunately, he didn't work directly on the site and couldn't offer any details about it. But he did mention that it was a very exciting campaign to work on, and that Microsoft gave everyone on the team a copy of the game along with some other goodies. Verizon was a big sponsor of Alan Wake. The original version of the game contained Verizon product placement, billboards, an in-game commercial, and they even got the bright presence to say their catchphrase. Verizon was also behind some of the Easter eggs in the game. There used to be something called Microsoft Tags. The tags were discontinued in 2015, but when they were active, they worked similarly to QR codes. You could scan a Microsoft Tag using a Microsoft app on your mobile phone. Alan Wake contained three Microsoft Tags, which were replaced with QR codes in the PC port and Alan Wake Remastered. One code brought you to a site that gave you a code for an exclusive Alan Wake Xbox Live theme. The other two codes gave you phone numbers. One was for the voicemail inbox of Alan Wake, and the other led to an answering machine message from Emil Hartman at the Cauldron Lake Lodge. Verizon put out a case study video on this campaign, however, it really exaggerates the whole thing. A player can be seen scanning a painting in Alan's apartment, but the actual Microsoft tags didn't look like that, they looked more like this. The video claims that the player would receive phone messages that perfectly sync up with the game, and we see the player's phone ring when Alan's phone rings in the game. Again, this isn't totally accurate. As much as I'd like to be wrong about this, from my own experiences and everything I've been able to read on the topic, the game would never actually call your phone, and nothing really syncs up directly with the game. You get Dr. Hartman's number in the lodge, which is appropriate, and you get Alan's voicemail number in his apartment. But the messages you hear just add a bit more flavor to everything, and don't actually directly relate to what's happening in the story when you find those tags. I'm not sure who the target audience was for this video, but it seems like Verizon is really overselling their contributions here. Still, what's clear to me through all of these examples of Alan Wake marketing is that the game inspired a lot of unique campaigns. Given how little information I could find about some of these efforts, I imagine there are a handful more out there that have been lost to time, but hopefully this little recap of what I could find was an interesting journey. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to Hidden Machine. We've got a ton of other deep dives into all sorts of video game stuff, with plenty more Remedy videos in particular if that's your thing. Also, all the videos I mentioned here, the case studies and everything else, have been uploaded to our other channel called The Ocean. So if you want more Remedy rarities and archival materials, check that channel out as well. And until next time, uh, see ya.